One of the concepts we have tried to wrestle with in the Irish context, a colleague of mine, John Brewer, who's a sociologist at Queen's University, has developed this theory called the political peace process versus the social peace process. And just a little quotation from just to kind of set this into context, where he says there, however, the negotiated settlement is never the end of peacemaking, for accords mostly leave unresolved the processes for realizing social healing. This is what I refer to as the social peace process, by which I mean reconciliation between erstwhile protagonists, social relationship building across a communal divide, social society repair, and replacement of brokenness by the development of tolerance and compromise. The sorts of actions that focus the social peace process include truth and reconciliation procedures, forgiveness and atonement strategies, policies that facilitate and encourage public tolerance and compromise, new forms of memory work, memorialization and remembering, public apologies, attention to cultural symbols such as national flags, anthems and the like, and the reassessment and reevaluation of identity. Uh, George Mitchell, the American Democratic Senator, as many of you know, chaired the talks leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. And he was incredibly prophetic when the deal was done, he said this. If you think getting this deal was difficult, implementing it will be even more difficult. And my colleagues here from the Irish contingent would assure you categorically that 21 years later, we are still painfully moving through the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. And I often say to Israelis and Palestinians, don't assume that when you eventually get over the line that the deal is done. And the irony is that so many times, politicians work on the assumption that once the deal is done, societal healing will automatically follow. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, politicians, by their very DNA, are people of short-term vision. As you know, particularly in this space tonight, the most important thing, perhaps, in most Israeli politicians' minds tonight is the third election. Uh, in our space, within the UK and Ireland at the moment, it is the Brexit election on the 12th of December, and in the United States, November 2020. And that's why people like us in this room who are part of what we call the social peace process are really key to bringing about major transformation. Just want to highlight two things very, very briefly and then through some questions. Uh, I've spent most of my, my life, I mean professionally, I'm a kind of Methodist clergy person, but never more than about 100 metres from what we call peace lines or interfaces in the Irish context. Uh, from 92 to 99, myself and a Catholic, a uh, Dominican sister, a Noreen Christian, who had spent 25 years in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, put together a space called Forspring, where we combined the sacred and the secular. So we were combining religious organizations with secular organizations. From 99 to 2014, uh, we put together a project called Skenos, and I just want to highlight a couple of things in relation to that. It ended up a $30 million, as I described it, uh, post-conflict, shared space, urban village. We ended up with a staff of 100 people, 50% Catholic, 50% Protestant. Uh, we ended up creating a space also there where there were 150 people living in sight and 150 people working in sight. And one of the most deprived neighborhoods in Belfast. And really the whole concept was developing this mixed-use development on the Newton Arch Road between two streets that none of you will probably know called D Street and Templemore Avenue. Spill this on a little. And we use it for political conversations, generational conversations, conversations about health, about social issues, and environmental issues. I guess in the early days, I suppose, when this vision came about, I really described it as a kind of birth to death approach to conflict transformation. So while a major component of that would have spilled out of a religious component, 
we ended up partnering with five or six other secular organizations. So we put in a day center for frail elderly. We put in a day center for people with mental health issues. We brought in a theater company. And we really used this mixed use to create space. But in our context, we still use the phrase, and we could be doing better at this at the moment with the chaos of Brexit, what we really have called uncomfortable conversations. Because I think a lot of peacemaking, as I've kind of looked at it globally, it doesn't drill down and deal with the real issues. So bringing people into a room with very different political, national identity, etc., etc., those conversations are going to be incredibly uncomfortable. And so we were trying to create spaces to allow those conversations to happen. We also wanted to increase the porousness of the community to address some of those deeper issues of regeneration. And we used art and symbolism to also create new ways of imagining. I mean, it's no state secret, Belfast is peppered with uh, political murals, wall paintings, really depicting my side against your side or your side against my side. And even post-conflict, the biggest issue we are dealing with today, excluding Brexit, is legacy and dealing with the past. So facing the Skanos building, for example, which is in a more or less a distinctly Protestant neighbourhood, there is a wall mural with six or seven newspaper headlines from a very Protestant perspective, always telling what the Catholics did to us never what we did to the Catholics. And there's this kind of interesting strap line across it where it says, the price of peace is eternal vigilance. It almost sounds semi-spiritual. It actually means always keep an eye on the scum on the other side. You can't trust them. And that's how those two communities still see each other 21 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. I'd still want to suggest it is one of the most successful peace processes in the planet at present, but we're still a very deeply divided, segregated society. And I suppose Brexit, and we'll not go there, or none of us will be home before midnight, has really disturbed a lot of hard-won gains over the last number of years. We also developed Skenos there as a social enterprise, uh, and that has ended up a project, I'm guessing, about three to five million dollars, uh, trying to use a social economy project as a way of bringing people together, uh, particularly younger, primarily males, who may have gone into the penal system. We've been able to negotiate with our probation board, where instead of going in and serving a tiny sentence of three to six months and learning how to be a better criminal, they actually come and be part of a social enterprise project, like doing upholstery and refurbishing, etc., etc., in relation to that. But I think from our perspective, and I know some of my colleagues will be speaking tomorrow, I mean, uh, Jonathan Sachs, the Jewish theologian, once said, uh, weapons win wars, but ideas win peace. And I think one of the things out of this conference I would like to hear are a number of ideas of mapping a way forward in relation to this. I think it's not often a group of us have the opportunity to get together and I've often said, I came here to Jerusalem, I mean, I've been in and out of this space numerous times. We've had a thousand Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast in the last seven years. But I remember a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak at a restorative justice conference put together by two lawyers. And so the worry was, is this just going to be within a legal framework? And it wasn't. But because they had the wisdom, they asked theologians, ethicists, historians, philosophers, psychologists, and so for me, peace building should always be a multidisciplinary approach. It doesn't sit within the remit of just urban planners or theologians or psychologists or social workers. It has to be a corporate approach because, as we all know, conflict affects every single fabric of our life. Okay, that's me. Over to you guys. Now I keep it short. I'm not a long preacher.